goes fine. <laughs> yeah, one of the attorneys involved uh, in fighting against the abuse of human rights of activists and the ICO family, as we call them, uh, the indigenous people of Biafra. And you are in Nigeria today after you were denied access to Namdi Khan. You can call him your client. Yes. Correct. By the, uh, the department known as the State Security Services in Nigeria. But they self style themselves as the Department of State Services. <laughs> so we call them DSS as it is. But their real name is DSS. I think when they discovered that uh, uh, they started acting like the Hitler rights in Germany, the yeah. SSS or so that right. era. Yes. They tried to change, but they have not characterized the change. So, what happened? Yes, you just tell Ifu, what was your encounter like? For the first time on Nigerian soil, with this major security behemoth known as the SSS. Uh, I'd like to begin by underscoring that we did everything according to the judge's order. Uh, which permits Namdi's lawyers to visit on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, the order is categorical. It doesn't say we need to be escorted or, you know, it's dependent upon uh, any particular presence of the DSS uh, at the facility. And adequate notice was given uh, by Ijefor that I would be one of the two lawyers to visit Namdi on Thursday to discuss his legal case, which has enormous ramifications, not only for Biafra and Nigeria itself, but internationally, uh, since it involves, among other things, a kidnapping and torture of someone who's then later detained. So we drove to the facility, I did with Ijefor. Uh, it's not all that, uh, what I would call, user-friendly. Uh, you see people <laughs> carrying very, very uh, uh, advanced weapons, uh, on your way into the facility. But they didn't disturb us. We went and we checked in, as was proper. Uh, didn't make any noise or commotion. We went and sat in a waiting room. Uh, ordinarily, it's about five minutes before you're permitted to see uh, the individual you're authorized uh, to consult. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, a gentleman entered and announced, not very convincingly, that the person who was supposed to escort us down the hallway was on a special assignment, and therefore we couldn't visit with none. Now, he didn't say that with much conviction. And moreover, the plausibility of that being true was highly remote. Uh, there was advance notice, days advance notice given of my presence with Ijefo, uh to speak to Nambi about his legal case. This is not something that happened at the 11th hour. Uh, and so you have to ask, why did he just make up, which is clearly a falsity, to justify denying access to Namdi Khanna? We're not talking about doing anything in violation of law. It's trying to vindicate the rule of law, human rights law, and his, his rights as an individual, and also the rights of all Nigerians in living in a state where the rule of law prevails. It's not just arbitrary tyranny. So this was a very, very important meeting to have. It wasn't to, to undermine you know, any system of law whatsoever. Uh, and so we were escorted out of the building uh, and returned <laughs> quite dumbfounded that there would be such a brazen lie told. Because it's fanciful to say you have somebody on special assignment, there are literally hundreds of other persons there that could escort us to the, <laughs> to the detention facility. Yeah. It's not like you need high energy physics training to walk <laughs> down the hallway, open a door. That's pretty simple even for elementary school children. So I think that I have deduced, and I think Ijefor would as well, that the Nigerians are frightened uh, of the United States and me in particular. I've done nothing other than just argue law in cases. Indeed, you would think that the Nigerians now, and the government struggling with restructuring, trying to evoke confidence that you can trust their pledges, whatever they are, in time to revamp this dispensation would be going out of their way to give confidence that they'll comply with court orders. This undermines any public confidence, Biafrans, Yoruba, anyone. Well, if they can just flout the law so blatantly 
and without even embarrassment. It, number one, the court order said nothing about being escorted. We were there, according to the court order. And two, it wasn't even a good falsehood, because <laughs> it was so blatantly contrived at the 11th hour. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're going to be uh, any less uh, uh, assertive in demanding the rights that Namdi Kano is entitled to. In fact, all Nigerians are entitled to. Um, we expect to return on Monday, consistent with the court order, uh, and also suggesting to the court that the Nigerian government is in contempt. Uh, the order had nothing to do with people being on special assignment or not. We showed up. We didn't have any arms. There were nothing that we were doing that was disruptive or threatening, and they said no. So we're very disappointed that uh, this looks another step backwards away from the rule of law and further earmark of, of the kind of tyranny that Namdi Kanu and Biafrans are, uh, are revolting against today. And I say revolting not in the sense necessarily of doing anything more than self-defense, but saying we can't live under this situation. And an American whose own declaration of independence identifies grievances we had against King George III. You know, the grievances, if you look at one, no taxation without representation, <laughs> those pale in comparison to the grievances of being slaughtered. You know, the people get designated as terrorist organizations, there's no hearing, there's no law, there's nothing, um, and all the occupations of any power in the government are all filled by Fulani. It's obviously that there's ethnic religious discrimination ongoing. It's far more acute than anything that provoked our American Revolution. Uh, and so we have a natural sympathy uh, for the ambitions and quests. It's not because we have any anger or, or necessarily hostility towards the Fulani. Hey, they're human beings like others. But if you, can't, if you can't mix together in any way that respects equal rights, then you've got to build fences. We once had a very famous poet named Robert Frost, and he said, good fences make good neighbors. You know, good boundaries make good neighbors. And so we need to go back and think about, well, is it time to re-examine you know, the sensibility and the honoring of human rights? the right of self-determination by questioning the boundaries that really are nothing more than a legacy of colonial powers in Europe that didn't have a clue of what they were doing when they drew the boundaries and didn't have an interest at all in the welfare of those whom they were ruling over. They just drew laws everywhere, you know, in, in Paris and Berlin or whatever and said, okay, those are the boundaries. Uh, well, you can always renegotiate boundaries and they say it's not novel. We recently witnessed in 2011 the South Sudanese with a referendum voted to secede from Sudan. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that everything is perfect, but at least you don't have the conflict that was ongoing previously. And even before then, the United Nations organized a referendum in what was then called Southwest Africa, now Namibia, to basically secede from South Africa. So these kinds of uh, secession movements are not unusual. In Great Britain recently, Scotland voted as to whether they wanted to secede. In Canada, Quebec voted whether they want to, to secede. These are fundamental rights of self-determination. And there's nothing that's, that is um, uh, treasonous or uh, antithetical uh, to democracy about having this kind of referendum uh, determining the, the boundaries and, and fate of countries. You know, we, the, 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 the international system is a lot like a petrified forest that never changes. It does change, uh, and it should change in response to claims of justice. The U.S. typically would have active position on the issue of Biafra education, but the U.S. has been unusually quiet, you know, in terms of international uh, policy. On Biafra. What do you think is responsible for that? You've been a high level US official before. What's going on? Well, I think there, after 9 11, there was great ambivalence in the United States about any group that was called a terrorist organization, no matter how fanciful. Um, and it wasn't just limited to Nigeria, Sri Lanka, and even in the Uyghurs in, in China. That was the tactic that the international community knew would get the United States to be worried if they identified any group as a terrorist organization once we declared war everywhere in the world and in the galaxy against terrorism. And I think that the United States, because it said that uh, Boko Haram is terrorist, we need the assistance of the government to fight the radical Islam, and they don't really understand, you know, Biafrans are largely Christian, you know, there's nothing radical about, you know, their history or anything of that sort. 
And because Nigeria is not what I call a top-tier issue, where you have people focused on it, because the United States at present is worried about Afghanistan, the Uyghurs in China, the South China Sea, issues with Chechens and Russia, so and, and Iran's nuclear weapons. So it doesn't get the kind of concentrated attention that you've discussed that would enable us to be more sophisticated about what's going on here. And that's why I think the Nigerian government was kind of frightened of my appearance, because in some sense, I'm here as part of my role to surface and internationalize the plight of the Biafrans, indeed all Nigerians living under tyrannical government. And that's what they worry about. They think they can obfuscate enough and then push it into the back burner area and say, oh, we're fighting terrorism, so we need weapons to fight terrorism, even though the weapons are diverted to killing civilians. Uh, and because there isn't high-level concentrated focus on the issue, they can get away for it, at least for a time. But they can't get away for it forever. You know, justice will not sleep. Uh, and that's, say, part of my mission here and back in the United States is precisely to make sure justice doesn't sleep when it comes from the Africans. But that did not apply to the Niger Delta militancy. Someone could say, well, it was because the U.S. was interested in oil, so they were all years when the militancy was going on in the Niger Delta region. But the same is not applicable to the Biafrans now. Well, that's prob there's some truth in that, to be sure. I mean, there's no doubt that the United States historically has blinked and squinted at countries that supply oil. I mean, most dramatically is Saudi Arabia. They even assassinate our journalists, you know, and we continue to sell weapons to Ambia, the crown prince. And everybody, the CIA, has concluded, yeah, he was the one who orchestrated the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. But I don't want to suggest that it's, it's, it's dispositive of the issue oil. I mean, in some sense, the United States has come upon great discoveries of natural gas through fracking and oil. We don't import oil anymore. So the ability to use the oil weapon, if you will, to leverage uh, policy out of the United States is much, much diminished. Uh, I do not think that is what is going to be decisive as the United States will be confronting what is its policy towards Nigeria. I do think the human rights issue and the concern about having Nigeria turn into somewhat like a, a failed state. They're worried now more so because they see Afghanistan and Taliban, are we gonna have a resurgence of Al-Qaeda? You know, if you end up with Nigeria, all Sharia states, and the government completely controlled by the Fulani radicals, uh, that will be very, very, very problematic for the United States. We already know that the United States has some inkling because we've had a, a, you know, a handful of special forces die uh, in Mali, Chad, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, uh, and maybe in the future in Cameroon because of the spillover effects of the Boko Haram radical uh, terrorists uh, into neighboring countries in West Africa. And that problem is going to be uh, multiplied many fold uh, if, if, if this government is able to succeed in basically suppressing all dissent and having it totally operated by Fulani uh, who believe that uh, you know, power ought to come out of the barrel of a gun. You know, the plundering and, and, and killing the Afrins is the livelihood. You know, that's, that's not a formula for anything but, but chaos and upheaval in Nigeria, which does nothing but help the terrorists. You once uh, filed some cases at the International Criminal Court against some Nigerian officials. Can you give us an update about that? Well, it's difficult because the International Criminal Court that sits in The Hague you know, they, they, you, it's not like they're open, this is what they're doing. Uh, what we, we, we charged uh, uh, General Burtai and, and uh, President Buhari with genocide, crimes against humanity. They take the filing, they stamp it, and they, even, even the actual clerks at the ICC are sufficiently fearful of retaliation. They don't even give you their names. They have no, <laughs> you walk in and they have numbers on them, that's all. Um, so we just know that uh, our filing was not the sole one charging uh, the leadership of the government with genocide. It's an ongoing investigation. Now, we filed at a time when the chief prosecutor uh, was from Gambia. They've shifted the chief prosecutor, but that doesn't mean that the evidence is any different. Uh, we will be alerted, but oftentimes I say uh, there's difficulty because the, the government that's uh, charged with these crimes doesn't cooperate. Uh, you had something very similar in, in Kenya, where the, the president of Kenya was intimidating witnesses and the case kind of went away. 
because he couldn't get uh, witnesses to testify. So that's what makes um, the need, in my judgment, uh, beyond the International Criminal Court, and I don't want to sound boastful as an American, but if the United States doesn't get involved in behind it, it's not going to happen. It's, it's as simple as that. We basically have all the cards right now because we have leverage with financial aid, humanitarian aid, weapons, the ability to send the military anywhere. And that's why it's critical to get the United States on board and, and alert to what the danger to U.S. interests are if Nigeria ends up as a haven for terrorists. I mean, remember one of the most famous terrorists in the United States, uh, Abdul Mohammed, he was a Nigerian who went and he was radicalized, he flew to Yemen, and then he was trying to blow up you know, an airplane on Christmas Day, uh, and he was caught by a passenger. So we have first-hand experience in the United States with the possibility of terrorism blossoming, if you will, in Nigeria, in creating a direct danger to our own citizens. You also have taken up the role of ensuring that Nigeria doesn't get sold more weapons yeah. from the U.S. Uh, they already had delivered about six to kind of jets, and I think there are six other ones on the way. So do you think you're going to make any progress, any success well, in that? Or well, the, 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 the lawsuit is there? outstanding. We haven't had an answer uh, from, the, say, we sued the Secretary of State there, Tony Blinken, who is responsible for certifying that the weapons will not be in the hands of security forces guilty of egregious human rights violations. That's the U.S. law. It's called the Leahy Law because yeah. there's a famous senator, Pat Leahy from Vermont, mm -hmm. who's the sponsor of these prohibitions. Uh, we haven't received an answer yet. It's still, they still have time under our federal rules. Uh, but we're also working in Congress at any time, irrespective of what the executive branch decides. And remember, this was a decision made by President Trump, not President Biden. He's pre President Biden, unfortunately, because he's got other things he's preoccupied with, I think has permitted this sale to move forward, even though at a slower pace than otherwise. But Congress can ban you know, the sale at any time. And, and demand the return at any time by statute. There, I think we have already uh, made uh, approaches and overtures. Uh, Chris Smith of New Jersey is very, very uh, concerned about the human rights situation uh, in Nigeria. And there is also a considerable portion of Christians in the Congress who are very worried that the Biafrans are the most persecuted group of Christians on the globe and uh, have, have spoken out against uh, the genocide for that reason. So it isn't just the lawsuit, but it's created an interest and sparked concern in Congress because it surfaces uh, what otherwise would go under the radar screen, which is what Nigeria wants. The more we can get sunlight on what's happening, uh, the better it is for human rights for everyone, so to speak. And I say that's what's, you know, it's disappointing, uh, but speaks volumes that it's obvious the Nigerian government is trying to suppress, you know, all the evidence. Uh, which is almost a concession. They know if sunshine was cast, it would be very unfavorable to them. So another point is Nandu Kano kidnapped practically from Kenya. Yeah. Surprisingly, the international media is quiet about this. Yeah. What do you think is responsible for that? You know, this is not a, this is a kind of uh, atrocity committed. You know, by state or non-state uh, actors that would normally attract breaking news headlines all over the world, but not much is heard out, you know, about that outside of uh, the Nigerian media uh, locally. What are you doing about making sure that this particular part of the story is told to the world, that, you know, a citizen of the UK, not the Nigerian at this point, is dual citizen, but he was carrying a UK passport, gets kidnapped from his base in Kenya, probably dropped and flown, you know, with an unmarked plane outside of Kenya to Nigeria. We just found out one day that he's here. We don't know the cycle. Nobody can tell the full story. Do you have something to tell those who are watching what really happened? Well, I think there, there are a couple of uh, explanations, if you will, not justifications. One. Uh, you have to remember that in this globalized community, you know, the Namdi Kano story is competing against literally volumes of other stories that are capturing attention. Say, the evacuation of Afghanistan, you know, it was like 24-hour news for a whole week, and we will continue on uh, until all the evacuations 
uh, of those who, who are, uh, in some sense, siding with the U.S. during the war. And, and we have articles every day about uh, China and the Uyghurs there and excluding goods made with forced labor. Uh, anyway, there, I, I can recite a whole litany of other news stories. And you've got to remember, now, you're competing for, with all these other stories. The news anglers is something fresh. But that's not the sole explanation. I think also that it is very important because the news media is like other uh, organizations. You know, you got to push and shove to get something before them. Uh, you know, they aren't going to naturally gravitate uh, and, and, and undertake on their own initiative uh, things that the reporters or that they don't know about. And I do think that it's an important component of us here uh, to make reach out. I've reached out to the Washington Post reporters, and we got a story about the Super Tucano lawsuit for that reason. Uh, but you have to have an outreach media effort. Uh, otherwise, you know, in, unless the story is a, a nuclear bomb or something, it, it doesn't get into their radar screen. Um, and that's part of the, adv the public advocacy effort, is to meet with the reporters, explain, give them background, I, you know, have press kits, so they are able to understand. For most Americans, you know, we're sitting in Abuja, they wouldn't know Abuja is the capital of, uh, of Nigeria. And you talk to them about the, the, the House of Fulani and their heads you know, start to spin. Um, so part of our role and obligation is to educate. Um, educate in a way that is understandable and, and digestible by our audiences there. And that's another thing that we need to remember in this whole campaign. Um, the, the human mind uh, reasons by analogy. And if you're speaking to an American audience, you can't say Python dance too and they'll understand what it is. You have to say, oh, it was like the Battle of Manassas in the Civil Wars. Oh, okay, now I get it, because we do have an American audience that knows what a Civil War is about. So it has that kind of skill that enables you to penetrate the otherwise different histories and, and cultures of the two nations. Uh, and that's an important ingredient, not the sole one, of course. Uh, but uh, that's, and, and, and news can sometimes be very flukish. You remember a couple of years ago, uh, there was a social media event about uh, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. And it just went, it, 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 it went viral. Nobody really knew why. And then it stopped and now it's off. No one's read about the Lord's Resistance Army for two or three years. You don't know what's happening. Um, so those things also, well, we don't have real explanations for, but we need to be always out there with a story to tell. So when the time is right, you know, it does, uh, it does able to, to take off uh, in the, the news media, the social media, and otherwise. While you're here, supposing the Nigerian government invites you to a meeting to say, hey, let's talk about why you're here, uh, would you be willing to meet with them? Of course, I'd meet with anybody interested in the rule of law. This is not about vengeance. No, justice really is international. And everybody recognizes the right you know, self-determination, the due process. It's universally condemned. Torture is extrajudicial killings. And uh, you know, and sit down and say, listen, I have an expertise in constitutional law. The, that's, and, and it seems very odd to me from the United States that Nigeria lives under a constitution ordained by a military dictator in 1999 with no input from the public, mm -hmm. <laughs> no referendum, nothing. And you're still living under this, you know, 22 years later? To me, it seems utterly absurd. How does that document have legitimacy? How do you give legitimacy to a legal instrument so that it'll be complied with, rather than just manipulated, you know, to benefit those who have the power? Uh, but I, I'm always someone who believes in uh, Winston Churchill, better to jaw, jaw than war, war, sit down. Uh, we, uh, we have a very um, uh, professional uh, conversation. You know, what are the issues? How are we going to address them? Um, you know, they have ideas. I'm not claiming I'm omniscient. Uh, people can learn from one another, but that's the way, that really is the heart and soul of, of civilized governance. It's communicate, discourse, listen. Nobody should believe that, that uh, they might not be wrong. I could be wrong, they could be wrong. That's why we need to talk it out and see whether we can come to some consensus as to at least the optimal way to, to deal with inevitable differences between people. So, you know, apart from Namdi Canada, a lot of uh, Biafran activists or militants, as the Nigerian government wants them to refer to, who are detained all over 
you know, are you doing anything to help with this situation as well in an international attorney involved? Well, I think the, 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 in some sense, to promote and argue for the rule of law helps everyone. Um, that's, that, that's due process, doesn't know any color barrier, doesn't know any religious barrier, doesn't know any territorial barrier. I mean, that's what I think it's the heart and soul of, of civilization itself. Due process, I could be wrong, listen to both sides, have a neutral uh, adjudicator decide uh, where the rights lie. Uh, and that's, 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 it. And that's why the everybody is the beneficiary of that system. Um, and that's what I would hope it could be brought uh, to bear in, in Nigeria. After all, it's the most populous country in all of, uh, all of Africa. It has great, great opportunities. Um, but ultimately, uh, the fate of nations depends upon what I call the human capital, even more than oil or diamonds or gold. We know lots of countries, even in Nigeria, some are going to be blessed with huge resources, and if it's all a corrupt system, it all gets squandered, and the people live in, in are impoverished anyway. Uh, and it's the human capital that consists not only of the ability to make money, but an ability to get along with each other through mechanisms of law, uh, so that disputes are resolved legitimately, uh, without resort to violence, uh, and, and that's something that uh, I think is urgent in, in Nigeria. There's a flip side to all this. You are in Nigeria, and this is the land of a dictator. Supposing they grab you and put you on a plane to go back to the U.S., what do you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I would be disappointed, uh, but I am very humble. I live in the United States, which has enormous flaws. But you know, I get up. My I live really, literally within a one block of the Congress and the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, I walk to work, and I'm awed by our forefathers who were able to craft a system that protected liberty. Um, and I understand that you here in Nigeria, in the Biafra, you're taking far more risks than me. It's just an accident. It's a fluke. I happen to be born in the United States. I'm glad that it was, but I, I, I certainly didn't have any responsibility for that. It just happened. Uh, so, you, you know, you, you can't make progress, you know, unless you take some risks. It's not, you don't do foolish risks, but there's an old saying that, you know, a tortoise makes its progress only by sticking out its head. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it stays in its shell. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the attitude that I have. You know, I surely would not welcome it, but if it happens, it happens. Others have uh, suffered far more grievously than, than that. And one of the issues, uh, one of the things you talked about in this conversation is the fact that most U.S. citizens live in this kind of bubble regarding what's happening outside. It will have, you know, if you're looking at them today, you can have them just listen to what you have to say. How can you break this down to them that, you know, this is one part of the world, Nigeria, where egregious atrocities are committed, are being committed, mm -hmm. you know, against a few people, I mean, a set of people, not a few, lots of people, you know. Uh, and this didn't start today, uh, mm -hmm. between 1967 and 1970. Uh, yeah, before I was born, over six million people had to be killed for the same reason, just to keep Nigeria united as they claimed at that time and today we're back on the verge of another civil war you know what can you have told them before they start contributing money on cnn for refugees and all that to just get the message across to them that um, we're on the verge of another it, atrocious it, it, it's war it's a challenging issue of, of human nature you know, if you're too sanctimonious and try to preach to them and say, listen, you should be involved, you're lucky, you're, you know, people resist that. So you have to be very tactful and say, you know, we really do have a responsibility when we know evil is ongoing, at least to, to denounce it, to not be complicit in it. Because at some point, silence becomes complicit. Um, and that this is a way, and everybody has a different way in which they can try to advance the cause of justice. You know, some can be contributions, some can just be standing protest, telling your children about what's happening there, and you sh they, we, sh we shouldn't be supporting that. And obviously, even in the United States itself, writing a member of Congress and saying we shouldn't be selling weapons, the Super Tucano, those small ways to indicate in their own uh, 
uh, uh, protocols, uh, their opposition. You know, everybody has different uh, competing demands on their time. Uh, but I say it's, 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 it requires tech. You, you can't come and preach and tell them, okay, I'm Jesus, I'm Moses, I'm Muhammad, and you need to do X, Y, Z. That's, that's going to work. Um, you have to be um, more indirect, suggesting, you know, we're very fortunate in the United States, uh, and uh, we don't have to worry about a knock on the door or a house being burned down the next day. Uh, but that's all the more reason that we ought to be concerned with the plight of others who do confront those kinds of dangers. And this is, you'll feel better for yourself uh, that you helped uh, uh, the world become a little better place. We have a very, our architect of the Constitution, James Madison, he said that the end of civil society is justice. That's why we have civil society, is justice. So we all need to be engaged in that particular quest as at least part of our, our vocation between ashes to ashes and dust to dust. I wish I could ask, what is the end of justice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, somewhere around here. Let me just turn to Barista so Ejiofor for, for a second. Uh, you had been uh, going through some disturbing level of, uh, you know, uh, I would say violation of your right as a lawyer and privacy. Each time you send a team down to the DSS office, you were stripped almost naked before you could see it. I mean, what do you have to say to that? What, what's been the experience in the last few visits? Thank you so much. Um, I'm pleased with the father affair. The media was um, referred to the DSS now as well as um, outfit. Because um, it's something they have a history of um, clouting cotton dust. And um, I'm proud that you are also reporting the same. We are aware that when he was abducted in Kenya, when our client Nam Bikano was abducted in Kenya, specifically on the 19th of um, June 2021, and subsequently brought here through a summary edition on the 26th of uh, June. He was taken to court with a reference to us on the 29th of June. So, and um, consequently, the court adjourned the matter to the 6th of July for hearing. And ordered that we should start with hearing notices um, about the proceedings of that day. And on the 26th, we in court. Ordinarily, if they were civil, they would have respected the court directives and not to bring them to court on that day. But it was not brought to court on the 6th of July. That is the just part. So I'm very appalling that the DPP who was in court to, for the BF, for the federal government informed the court that the DSS could not come to bring him to court because of logistic care reasons. So um, we have been in this game before with them and we understand how they operate. So and we informed the court because we know fully well how they operate. Now we need a lot of courts on the guideline for visiting him pending when the matter is before the court again. And the court made that order that they should allow the lawyers access to him and also relatives access to him. Consequently, adjourned to the chambers for further um, uh, understanding as to the guidelines that will, that will guide the operation the visitation. So during the chamber sitting, it was before the sister DSS was also represented by one of the operatives, who is also a lawyer. The federal government was also represented by DPP and also a council in the matter of uh, tribe. I was there and two of my colleagues were also part of us. We have an understanding as to man and wish will be visited and that becomes another of course. It was agreed that we'll be visiting him on Mondays and Thursday between the hours of 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. At that point, it became an order of court. The man and wish will be visited. So DSS has no right whatsoever for us to determine the man and wish will be visited after the court has given an order. Then we went to court to visit him in line with the order of court. We had declared, we had, we had denied access to him. We went back to court 5 and 4th to commit DG of SSS for content. And the, when they were assigned with the content proceedings, we initiated before the federal court. They quickly called us to come and see him. Because they understand the implication of that. We went back to the SSS and then also altered. They altered the, 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 the order, the terms of the order of the court by stating that we should notify them in advance as to who and who is coming and uh, when we are coming. 
we have no problem because our all interest is just to guarantee his safety. For the meantime, we'll be in the custody of the SS. So we told them that we should determine them in advance. So several who have gone there on the, this visit. We don't think we have much issue with them before now. So, and they also, before uh, Mr. Bruce arrived from the US, I notified them that he will be coming. He sat on it. Mr. Bruce is a non constitutional law lawyer, right, right, lawyer in the US. And he has been has been IPB lawyer for so many years over there. And also personal counsel to Nandikam. So he flew to Nigeria to visit his client and also discuss the legal matters with him, which is within his constitutional right. So, and uh, we notified the DSS about his coming. Uh, they will not say they are not away, only for us to be, uh, be, be, be through there with this day, this day. Because uh, even the one who, the messenger who conveyed the message was planted, obviously, to show you that he wasn't connecting uh, in, his, um, in his message. He was actually trying to find the excuse to give us, not to see him. Because usually when you come and introduce and then inform them we are going to see him. It doesn't take more than 10 minutes for them to check us in and also have a chat with him. So but yesterday something not that happened. As long as they mentioned Mr. Bruce, the white man, is around to see him with the but they find the phone. This whole situation became tense. And I believe the the staff like was scouting for reasons uh, so to give us excuse to give us for not to see him yesterday. But I know that it's not far fetched from the manner in which lawyers we have been so friendly subjected to all forms of inhuman treatment and liberation on the cost of visiting him. So for the past four times we visited him, we are mistreated, we are maltreated by the DSS officials, we are treated like criminals. And uh, because when you ask a professional, a lawyer, to remove his shoes, his belts, his earrings, and also fondle his, some, some part of his body, one applicable to women, trying to search for incriminating substance, I believe something condemnable. And I've notified the NBA president about what you are passing through. Unfortunately, I believe you have done the bad work done because I told him that you NBA have to speak out about it. I told him, look, I sent to him about what lawyers are, are being subjected to. And we need to be protected. Lawyers need to be protected. I don't see reason why we should be subjected to that kind of form of treatment in the course of this our client. It's an order by the court and also supported by the law. Because we, we should be sitting to discuss this case with him. Assuming the matter is coming up, because I, I'm going to matter come for trial anyway before the time I don't for the trial for the hearing. How are you going to get set for the trial? you going to get for the trial without discussing with him? And they, we cannot be, we cannot be visited under the atmosphere of fear and intimidation. That is for the media. We should have a lifetime, I don't have to have a polite environment to have a discussion with him, a chat with him with our client. So, and uh, if a lawyer, it would be very highly unprofessional for a lawyer to visit a client. With an incredible substance. It is forbidden. That is, cannot be contemplated at all, was never. Which we have not done before, and we cannot do it because we respect that a profession. We go here with relatives. Even my writing materials were usually armed. We are being denied. We are not allowed to come in with writing materials. We are not allowed to come in with our shoes. We are, our belts are being asked to remove. We just fold their belt as if you're a criminal. Somebody is there on a investigation. You know what it means for when you are sent to Nigeria. Um, uh, uh, investigative authority, police, the SS, whatever you call it. First thing they will do to them is ask you to remove your slippers, remove your belt, remove your watch, remove your cap and everything. This is my cap, I'll remove it. They say, okay, go ahead, follow, follow, march, go, 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 as if you're a criminal. That's how they, how we have been treated. I've not seen such in the case of my partner as a lawyer. But that notwithstanding, we said, no problem. And I want my friend, my partner from US, a non-lawyer, to also witness him yesterday. But unfortunately, because they won't, they won't want the business to go to the to US, they won't want the business to fly outside this country. They were being smart, and I know it. We Monday we are going back again. So let me say, see if they will tell us that uh, maybe probably the person who is in charge or who will receive us now has uh, is having stomach upset. And in that case, uh, Mr. Bruce, you have to delay your travel and wait until <laughs> when the man is uh, when the man fully recovered. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Um, so uh, thank you also for your support yes. and being there for our client. Thank. No, no problem. Um, one last question I'd like to ask you, and this new journalist that just come in, in my ask, you know, I have some few questions for you, I don't know. Uh, is, uh, is there any recourse to any form of relief within international law? At this point yes, there is. Um, yes. There is a working group on arbitrary detentions that's an arm of the UN Human Rights Council that sits in Geneva. And I think Nandi's case fits uh, arbitrary detention like a glove. I mean, among others, Julian Assange is listed. 
and it, the, uh, the working group has authority to pronounce as a matter of international law whether a detention is illegal, uh, which would ordinarily taint and exclude any evidence that is obtained because or a result of the illegality. So that clearly is, is one forum uh, for relief for what's uh, transpiring for Nam Bikanu today, and I would hope to pursue that aim. And of course, one element of the arbitrariness of the detention is what we experienced yesterday, denying him access to his counsel pursuant to a court order, which was complied with on our side with great scrupulousness. Um, and, uh, and, and so that, that, that forum and platform does remain available. Well, I want to thank you. I hope on Monday you go there with uh, pants that don't use belts. <laughs> thank you so much, Olin. It's a pleasure having you on some Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Eh? And God bless you all. So Do you much. have uh, any questions? Question, yes, I wanted to answer. <coughs> okay. Okay. okay, let's go ahead. Yes, yes. Yeah. on the opportunity you have to visit him, how is the his, uh, health condition? Is he okay? Is he feeling okay? Because I heard that uh, his uh, health situation is also a bit okay. Of course, if you know that somebody who is uh, in that kind of confinement should not be okay, uh, so it's commonsensical. And apart from the fact that he was um, subjected to all forms of inhuman treatment and degradation while he was arrested and detained and abducted in Kenya, uh, we are fully aware he was taken to another destination where he was um, tortured and he was beaten and also um, inflicted with severe via pains and injuries before he was um, smuggled into Nigeria by the Israeli tradition. So he's still, um, he's fully to recover from that um, on the impact. And so uh, but, um, he's receiving treatment, but that notwithstanding, because we don't know the level of um, uh, contact he had with that uh, maltreated him in, in Kenya, tortured him in Kenya. So that's why we're actually asking the court to allow an international expert, uh, so an expert, um, medical expert to also to examine him from from foreign land. Uh, one of his doctors who are coming from overseas to as a mining is before the court, actually before the court now. So because we cannot rely on what um, they're doing here. But it's okay, it was a stable, firm and also a sound health a uh, sound um, mental wise. And um, uh, Mr. Bruce will have a little of seeing that and also confirming that on Monday when you see him. So but uh, we still need and expect advanced medical attention to be given to him uh, in which within the period of time we deal with them. So because where he is now, of course you know, somebody who is being denied access to friends and also to, um, to really, just apart from this, Junior Valley has seen him once. He understands the kind of uh, thinking, what's going on in his head. It's, there's nothing like, uh, no torture can be compared with that. When you don't have, you don't watch televisions, you don't, as such people, we alone kept somewhere, and allow once in a while to move around and also interact. I don't think it's, um, it's, 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 it's a mental torture, which I believe should be more grievous than even the one somebody who has been who is hospitalized. Because when you are in the hospital, you are talking with people. But in this case, you are not allowed to have contact with somebody you are there apart from when the lies come to visit you. So he's uh, being subjected to inhuman to, to, to mental torture. And so, and I want the authority to understand that part that is being tortured today as, uh, in the in the in that in the actual sense of it. So and then. Um, I also made it known to the world that he cannot stand trial while being defended. Yes, that cannot happen because we cannot effectively defend him and also interact with him and get to brief under this kind of environment. It can't happen. So of course you have witnessed what um, what part of what we are saying, and I believe by Monday you see the rest and also confirm to yourself. Uh, so um, let's see how it goes. I may not go further on this because we have other strategies to adopt in, in court that will assist our case. So thank you so much. I don't have taken to your question. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sorry. I know you've said, you said this before, but we came late. Just briefly, just mm -hmm. tell us how you are treated when you visited mm -hmm. your clients at the hospital of the ESS. Briefly. 